What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to My Social Life. This is the podcast where you can hear the real stories behind the people on social media. I'm your host, Jacob Kelly. And before we jump into today's conversation with Jay Swanson, there's a couple things that we need to go over first. Number one, if you enjoyed today's podcast, please consider leaving a rating and a review. The more positive ratings and reviews we get, the more it helps new people find the show. And it really helps to grow the community that we're developing here. And if you're one of those people that have recently found the podcast, welcome. I'm very excited to have you here. Make sure you subscribe and stay tuned for future episodes. And to everybody listening, make sure you screenshot this, post it to your Instagram story, tag at my social life podcast and at Jay Swanson, and I'll feature you on the account and send you a message as well. Now, without further ado, let's get to my conversation with Jay Swanson. What's going on, everybody? Welcome back to my social life. I'm your host, Jacob Kelly, and today we are joined by Jay Swanson. Jay is an American sci-fi and fantasy author living in Paris, France. On top of that, he's a YouTuber with over 40,000 subscribers documenting his life abroad and giving you tips whether you're planning to move or travel to France. And I'm very excited to have him here on the podcast today. Jay, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me on. It's my pleasure. So where I want to start, I want to talk about writing first and creativity. And I want to talk about, as far as I can tell, your first kind of creative endeavor. And that was in the first grade when you wrote and produced your own play. Can you kind of talk about that? Yeah, I think that might be as far back as at least my memories of those things go. Yeah, I, uh, well, yeah, I wrote basically uh, this play. I have very vague memories of it that involved, you know, like a princess trapped in a cave somewhere and a king and a queen going and a prince going to get her. I don't remember. My friend Morwan played the king. I do remember that. And I do remember that I wore a, a pink and gray striped sweater and I made my own sword out of, uh, I think it was like um, the planks from a fence, you know, like a picket fence. I think I took, I think I took a fence apart and basically turned it into a sword. And uh, I'm pretty sure it was uh, relatively nonsensical and uh, full of uh, un, unforeseen cliches because I didn't even know what a cliche was yet. But uh, it's on a videotape somewhere. I got to find that thing. That's awesome. So where did you perform that? Was that at school? Yeah, I was at school. Yeah, I'm pretty sure we just did it in front of our class. But it was the whole thing. I remember we like made a set, you know, painted like big cardboard boulders and things like that. And uh, and it had our epic moments jumping down into the cave and trying to save a princess. That's awesome. So clearly creativity is something that's been a part of you from the get. So at what point then did you realize that you wanted to be an author? Like when did that really like when did you decide this is what I want to be? Oh, man, I've always wanted to tell stories. I think that. Um, I mean, I always wrote down stories with friends or by myself, whether we were traveling, you know, I remember going to my grandparents with my buddy John for a week and uh, we just filled this notebook with adventures of fighting orcs and uh, dwarves. And I don't even remember what all, but I was kind of always written stuff down. And I don't think that as far as being an author was concerned, it wasn't necessarily the goal. I think as a kid, I always wanted to make movies. I, I saw scenes to music. I really interacted. I, I think for me, music's really important because it kind of transports me somewhere else. And, and which makes me, ironically, as a writer, somebody who doesn't appreciate lyrics very much because I never hear them until about the hundredth time I've heard a song. Um, I my sister is very into lyrics, and she, she'd sometimes be like, "Why the heck are you listening to this? This is garbage." And I'd be like, "What are you talking about? Like, I love this melody." I, all I cared about was like the beat and the melody and kind of what the emotional pull of the music was more than anything. And as an adult, I appreciate lyrics so much more, but I, I've always just loved letting my imagination wander to wherever it was transported. And um, and so I always just imagined making movies. And then uh, eventually I, you know, I did write and I did have ambitions of writing books. And I tried writing my hand at writing my first fantasy book right out of college when I moved to Nice, France to teach English. And it was so hard and I got nowhere with it. Um, and it was a good humbling lesson in that. And so it, it was one, something that I came back to later, largely because I realized I could do it on my own. And I really did enjoy telling the stories and having full control over it. But I don't think that it was necessarily the goal from the outset. That's fair. But then once you decided to do those books, you set the goal to publish a million words, right? It's about a new book every year for 10 years. Yeah. Uh, yep. That's, that's, I was, I figured, I figured if there, if I was going to be worth anything, I should at least write as much as possible and put it out there for people to see and critique and, uh, to make it just a, a part of the, the, the landscape. So yeah, my goal was to publish a million words before, uh, within 10 years, actually. Okay. And then, so was the Vitalis Chronicles, was that like your first, the first three books you ever published? Yeah, that was, those are the first, those were the first ones I ever published. Um, I started with White Shores when I was, I was living in Sierra Leone at the time. And, uh, we had a little launch party for it and everything else there in Freetown. And, uh, that is where it started. And then I, my goal was to publish at least one book 
every year for 10 years after that and uh, and just carried on from there. That's awesome. So I kind of talk about the process of writing a a sci-fi fantasy book. Like, where do you even start? Do you already have the ideas kind of hashed out in your head before? Do you kind of figure it out as you're going through the writing process? I think it's a combination of both, right? Like, I think even people that plan their books out entirely from the beginning, I mean, part of that planning process is, is, is part of the writing process. And I think you, whether you have a scene in your mind that really sticks out and you're writing around from or to that scene or Maybe you have a cool concept that you're trying to flesh out or whatever it is. I think that you've always got some idea going into it. And for me, I think where I always have tried to build my stories from is usually what like whatever the emotional payoff of the climax of the story is. And those are moments or somewhere really, really deep in the weeds um, in the story where there's a scene, there's a moment, there are characters. And for me, a lot of the process is just exploring that behind the scenes, like taking my time to explore these characters, ask questions about them. How did they get here? What happened right before this? Where did it lead them afterwards? And it's that kind of broadening of the scope uh, from a moment into a story that is my process. But that's long before I ever sit down to write it. Uh, And then by the time I sit down to write it, I'm basically writing towards an ending that I've already imagined and trying to pick up wherever the action is going to be the hottest. And then obviously editing it later reveals usually that I've done a terrible job of all of these things. And then you have to put in yet more work and it's always more work. One thing I'm really curious about in terms of when you're talking about coming up with these characters and asking questions about them is after you write these books down, do you kind of have all these different subplots and other things about the characters that aren't in the books, but you just know them to be factual in the world? Like I'm asking kind of from the example I always, I give is like JK Rowling always comes out with different things about Harry Potter that she didn't put in the books that she just says are canon. So is there stuff that you know about your characters that aren't in the books, but you just know that this is a fact about them yeah i think that i i think yes and no i think she's a rough one because i feel like she's retconning a lot when she does that you know like she's uh it feels kind of like she's throwing stuff in there that that should have been in the books um and i think for me the answer is always is yes to a degree there are some characters that just pop onto the page as you're writing and then you write them in because they serve a purpose and then that's it and then later you realize, oh, this person would be useful in another story, or there's an element to that person that I think really would be fascinating to explore. Um, so it's kind of a both and. I feel like there's always stuff that you that you know, like you write some backstory or you figure out like what it was that went into their motivation that maybe never makes it explicitly on the page, but hopefully ties them together as a character for the future. But I think it's also difficult because, and I feel, I also feel definitely um, empathy for jk good old jk my my good old buddy uh but you know that that sense that like you as you carry on with these characters they continue to live with you and you continue to revisit them and maybe as you're delving into other stories you come to realizations about them where you're like oh man like i wish i would have put that in or i'd love to find a way to tell this story a little bit more um and so there's yeah i don't know i think i think it's really both and like you just because the character is done being written and and is published in a book doesn't mean they stop living and growing in their own way down the line so that's a really hard one that's that's super interesting though one thing i was about talk to me about putting it all down on paper like how long does that take you do you have to go to a specific spot every time do you always listen to the same song like what is your process for physically writing look like um i usually i mean i like to write in public spaces like i like to uh, I, I wrote my first trilogy, the Vitalis Chronicles that you referenced, I wrote while I was living on a hospital ship in West Africa. So I was living in a metal box with like 400 other people and I had no privacy and no space and really had to learn how to ignore people because you would find a space to sit and write. And then anywhere that was remotely, anywhere that was not your bed basically was fair game for people to join you. Um, and so you had to put on like the biggest headphones you could find and sit facing at the most in an uninviting angle with the the deepest scowl and just forcefully ignore people um, in order to write. And that really taught me it was a valuable skill. Like I can write anywhere now, but um, it's also then left me like enjoying being around the activity and, and the hustle and bustle of other people. So I love to write in coffee shops, ideally, or, um, you know, places like that. I, I do like that, those kinds of environments. And then I always listen to, and my discovery playlist on Spotify is absolutely destroyed by, mostly electronica music like with often with a cinematic um theme to it there's like a cinematic element usually um 
a lot of like glitchy, not really dubstep dubstep stuff, but like whatever dubstep evolved into later. Um, some trancey stuff, some some you know, it's like all kinds of genres I probably don't even know exist that pump through uh, my sound system as I'm writing, and I really like that because like a lot of them can kind of carry on like this emotional subtext for you while you're writing without being distracting because uh, lyrics, as we said, even though I may not hear them very well, it's hard to write when you're hearing other people's words. So um, I tend not to listen to anything that has lyrics in it while I'm writing. Mm -hmm. I completely agree. And can you also talk to me about the importance of beta readers when you're putting a book together? Yeah, I think that I think my relationship with beta readers has really changed um, over the years because I used to go through kind of the traditional self-published process of writing it, drafting it, revising it, um, you know, kind of staring at it until I was sick of it and then send it off to more of like maybe alpha readers, a couple like a developmental editor type person um, who could tell me what worked and what didn't. Some big structural issues as they saw it, then you revise it, then you'd send it to beta. Uh, and then you might make changes on that. But what I found from like the beta experience was that it was so, it was really varied and often it's kind of like the hardest part is probably finding the right people to do it because it's really nice when you have people that, uh, will cheer you on and they'll read it and they'll be like, yeah, this is great. Like, I love this. I love that, whatever. Um, but they can't really necessarily put their thumb on exactly why they liked what they liked. And they, they, they may not be quite as, as literate uh to be able to tell you why they didn't like what they didn't like and when i say literate i don't mean that they couldn't read obviously they can read but like there's a level of there are levels of story literacy that we all have that we're all constantly developing um and some of us i'm imagining you're this way like we read books we watch video essays on youtube we're kind of bathing in it all the time to get a better idea of understanding why we like and don't like what we do and don't like um and the average person doesn't have that vocabulary so it it can be very helpful to to hear they do and they don't like certain things, but the helpfulness of that is limited in the end when you're trying to figure out why, like, why is this broken? Why isn't this working? So I've gravitated towards giving it to a few people, a much fewer people um, who really are more story literate, I guess you could say. Um, and then leaning into trusting that a little bit more than where I used to send it out to like 10 people just to, to get the pulse back. And what I, what I realized what I was also looking for in that and what I was getting was that cheerleading more than really hard constructive criticism. And so I've tried to lean more towards the people that ripped me apart and, um, and let them have a go at it than anything else. That's fair. And then you also, you self publish all of your books as well, right? Yeah, I do. So why, why do you self publish? Like what are some pros and cons to doing it that way? Well, because nobody wants my books. No, I'm just kidding, Jacob. Uh, the, um, the, well, the thing is that when I started, I, it was in 2010 in a storied time long before the advent of places like Reddit. Um, although I guess Reddit was around for a few years by then, but, um, yeah, like Amazon was still a thing. Like the, the Kindle was exploding. Like there was a real chance if you were just publishing, it kind of didn't matter what you were publishing. Like there was a chance to get it out there and find an audience in a way that's not true anymore. And, um, I also was insecure. I didn't really think that I had what it took to get through, uh, the query process to get an agent, to go to a publisher. I wasn't really that confident in my work. Um, and that's also where that million word goal came from was I was like, okay, well, if I write and publish a million words by then, I'm going to learn what the heck, what the heck it is I'm doing. And it'll be, you know, worth going this next step. Um, and I was also enamored with the idea of controlling the whole process and being able to commission and design my own cover and, uh, you know, having that relationship with my readers that was direct and something that I owned and something that if I developed it, it was uh, it was mine. Um, so there was a, like a business element that I really liked about it. There was the challenge. There was the fact that by doing it, I would forcibly learn everything I had to learn about publishing, I thought. Um, and I'm just kind of a self-starter go-getter. And that that really spoke to me. So it was a combination of different things that led me to that decision. And I uh, made an e-friendship with a woman who was writing um, mostly romance and erotica under different names. And she had written a book on why you should self-publish. And it was one of the ones I picked up and it, she made a very convincing case and she had a lot of really helpful stuff in it. We struck up a conversation and she was really the linchpin. Her name was Zoe Winters. And I haven't talked to her in probably, I don't know, eight years. But at the time she was really 
influential in my decision as well. And so I just launched straight into the self-publishing side and really enjoyed it. And really, I mean, it was a lot of work and the, the, the pros are the things that I listed, like you control it, you own it, you get to do everything. But the cons are that the, the buck also stops with you. If it's terrible, it's your fault. If it doesn't sell, it's your fault. You have no one else to blame. Um, and there's a lot of expense in it, you, uh, whether the, a lot of the costs have gone down over time and there's a lot of really cool resources out there that can help you uh, attain a higher level of quality without investing as much as I did early on. But it meant saving up for a while to be able to afford all those things and taking a really big risk and a really good chance that you would never see any of that money again. Um, and the the returns diminished on Amazon really quickly. Like it was the end of a golden era and that wave had washed out largely and uh, fewer and fewer of us were able to, to write it. So over time, you just saw diminishing returns as well on everything you were doing on Amazon. And it became, uh, yeah, increasingly challenging, but I still really enjoyed a lot of it. And you're still self-publishing today, even though you've stopped production for the time being, correct? Uh, yeah, so the I'm, I still self-publish. Well, the last book that I did was kickstarted. The last couple of books I've done have been kickstarted. Um, and th that one, Couriers, the one that I kickstarted, the sci-fi book that I kickstarted, uh, I guess, two years ago now, um, I had actually written for a publisher. So I had a publisher that I befriended on the con scene and uh, they asked me to submit to them, which was really cool. And so I submitted uh, couriers to them after some discussions about what they might be most interested in because I have too many ideas and I was like well why don't you guys influence my decision making on this which is a huge mistake because you should always just write the book you want to write just tell the story you want to tell write the book you want to write don't listen to anybody else just sit down and do whatever makes you most excited and what they were most interested in was the book that I was least interested in writing at the time um and I think it shows in a lot of ways and so I wrote it and they gave me some notes and asked me to revise it. And then I came back and they said, you know what? No, this isn't going to work for us uh, for these reasons. Um, and But they asked me to submit another book. And so I had another book that I was already working on at the time. So I finished that book and I submitted that book to them. And they said, thank you. We really like this book too, but it's also not for us. And it was a really hard lesson to learn in a sense because your pride, this is also the insecurity that I had kept me from ever writing for the traditional publishing world is I didn't want to get rejected by real people by, you know, the gatekeepers of the industry. But in the end, uh, it was one of the best things that ever happened to me because um, I ran into them later, you know, at, at actually at a convention in Dublin. I saw them at Worldcon and one of them grabbed me and took me aside. We were singing karaoke and he was like, oh, my God, I loved that book so much. I can't wait to read the next one. Like, thank you so much for sending it. And he just kind of gushed about it for a minute. And it reminded me that, like, this is not personal, like they're not saying no to my book because they think I'm stupid and ugly and they hate me. They're saying no to the book because they don't have a slot for it or it doesn't align with their audience or it doesn't, you know, like there are a number of very real professional reasons why they say yes or no to projects. Um, and that's where it lined up. There just were certain things with my book that it didn't align well with them as a publisher and they decided not to go for it. So I'm open to traditional publishing and we, you know, we're talking with a couple different publishers. Um, about possibilities. But part of the reason that I also am very open to and into self-publishing, and we're talking about, I don't know if you or your listeners will necessarily be familiar with Richard, the guy who's in my vlog, and we have a podcast together. And uh, he's also my editor at this point. He's a trained editor that used to work at Random House. And um, he is stellar. And we kind of just look at it and think like the ambitions that we have for my world and for everything we're doing are very large. And if we could find the right partners to work with, we'd be very open to it. But we're also very aware that we might be a little bit too big for our britches um, or our eyes might be bigger than our plates or whatever the terrible metaphor is that I'm butchering right now to try and communicate that we know that what we're trying to do, what I want to do, what I, I have so many ideas for these books and multi like I cross media, blah, 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 like just making a universe and experience for people, for readers, for viewers, for film, go for, you know, like whatever, like I, everything I want to do is just a little bit too out there. And so we're just going to work on developing everything we can at the core of that for now until either we're in a position where we can afford to do some of this stuff on our own or we find the right partners who are up on the vision and really, really excited to join with us and, and catch the same ride. 
And in terms of like being not necessarily in over your head, but I've seen you quote somewhere saying you have dozens of more book ideas coming. And on top of that, like I mentioned, you're reworking some of your current novels. Like why did you decide to cease production of your current catalog, rework it right now? Yeah, we actually deleted everything off the internet. Um, because it needs to be, well, because the thing is that it, when I say I have dozens of ideas coming, they're not, they're not disconnected. They're all in the same universe. So, um, when you take this, like, basically, it's, if you think about it as like a, a cinematic universe or a comic book universe or something like that, where you have multiple stories, characters over timelines, places, everything uh, exists in the same universe, but so much of it appears disconnected. And in reality, it's all an interconnected web. Every story that you tell, in my mind, should influence every other story if you're going to make one complete mega arc of a story. Um, and you see, like the MCU did, a, 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 I think, a good job of laying out a, a possible groundwork for how it can be done. Um, they're probably one of the, the ones that have done it the best so far. Um, and they're working from just a plethora of contradictory material that they're just trying to come up with their own canon uh, on the screen as they go. And so we removed all of the books that I've already written and we're going to rework them. And we're taking time to sit back because... Uh, we need to answer some big world building questions. We need to answer some really big foundational questions as to how the universe works, why things are happening, where we've come from, where we're going. Like I already know where everything ends and I have a really good idea where it began. And I have a lot of different stories outlined and characters that have popped in. And I'm, I go between in my showers, you know, either it's a, either it's a space opera night or it's a fantasy sword duel in the, the mountains night and it just kind of depends and i'm just like i just let myself go into it and work and refine these scenes that are in my head because it's not just that scene it's not just that sword fight or that space battle or whatever it's getting into like why are these characters here who are they what's wrong with them like what are they looking for why didn't they get it all these things that then break down into these deeper 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 questions and trying to find the way that's like, okay, well, we want to do all this world building, but we don't want to fall down an eternal world building rabbit hole. So how do we answer enough questions that we make this a fully fleshed out universe where we don't accidentally write ourselves into corners that we have to retcon out of later while still advancing and fleshing out just really evocative, emotional, present stories that even if you only ever read one book or you only ever saw one movie, you would walk away from it thinking, that was amazing. I'm so glad I saw that. And you'd be happy. And so like, how long do you think that process is going to take? Like, when do you the rest of, of my life, but when do you anticipate putting your books back out in terms of being able to purchase? Like, when are you going to start producing again? Well, that's a good question. We're, we, we're talking about, we're trying to figure out cause we recognize that we can't just talk about the process without ever producing anything. Um, in my mind, I would like to dedicate, I was saying I wanted to dedicate five years before putting anything back out. Um, yeah, Richard's kind of pushing against that because he wants to get stuff out sooner. So we're trying to find like a good balance where, for example, Into the Nanton is the story that we did that changed was also a big change with my relationship with like beta readers because I had none. Like I was literally publishing it as I wrote it. Um, and if, for your view, for your listeners who are unaware, Into the Nanton was basically this a real time fantasy blog. We built it as the world's first real time fantasy blog. So it was a story that was told through the journal of a. Uh, of, famous warrior who'd been exiled from his kingdom and sent into the the deepest darkest jungles in search of a man that he hated who was presumed dead uh, and so it's very much a, a thinly veiled death sentence and so you're reading day by day as he writes in his journal if he posted in the morning it posted in the morning if he wrote in the evening it posted in the evening and you kind of track along and we had artwork and we ended up making an audio version of it and all this and it was a really fun writing experience experiment for me to get out there and try to build an audience for this on the blog and we went on to kickstart one season successfully and, and failed to kickstart uh, the third season. But um, that one is one that because we already have so much material, we have all this artwork. Um, it's one that that we're we're like, OK, well, we can edit this, flesh it out a little bit more, maybe reorganize some of it and then get the voice actor who did the audio to redo it. We can relaunch that as a podcast. And we have some other ideas for getting it into people's hands. Um, that don't involve paper because that was there were no margins in that. If you print a full color paperback, you make no money. Um, but yeah, so that's that's kind of like, well, OK, let's if we put that out and we can re-release those seasons of the podcast, maybe that's a way of, again, building an audience while we're developing everything behind the scenes. But again, it requires and the reason that I'm hesitant is because it exists in a world that is 
you know, big and complex and has a lot going on. And I still feel like we have a minimum bar of world building to do, um, even for something with it as narrow of a focus as a guy's journal, um, just to make sure that uh, we're not, yeah, writing ourselves into any corners. We're like 10 years down the road, we're like, well, we wanted to have this empire fall in this century, but apparently they have to live on for another 200 years, you know? So like, that's the kind of thing where we were like, okay, let's, let's try to figure out some of this stuff in advance as best we can. And speaking of podcasts, you mentioned the podcast that you've recently started doing, which is kind of the intent behind it, correct me if I'm wrong, is but to chronicle the process of you relaunching your entire series. Yeah. Why, with all this work that you have to do in order to get to the point to relaunch your series, why was in the midst of all of this chaos, the decision to start recording podcast episodes That's important to you? Great question, because I'm a sadist and I just want to hurt myself. Um the basically because again there so we have you have this issue where and i'm sure you know this uh with your podcast and your work like there's a level of and i'm sure a lot of people listening will know what this is like it's really hard to build an audience it's not an easy thing um there are some people who get really lucky and it explodes and other people that have to work really hard for what they what they uh, can scrounge together and um i'm very fortunate that in the end i i worked very hard but i also have uh, the YouTube audience that you mentioned earlier, um, that's growing and that, and that, that actually, that pays my bills. Like I'm so fortunate. I'm so lucky to have them. Um, but so much of that is found the people find me and they gravitate towards me because I live in Paris and because I share, uh, insight into the city, how to visit it, you know, what to do when you're here, what to avoid that kind of stuff. And for me, like there's, there's a limit to how much of that stuff I can make. And there's also a limit to how much, like, I'm not, I'm not in Paris cause I want to be a tour guide. I'm in Paris cause I love this city. Um, and that motivates me to share my love of the city and to help people love it as I love it. Um, but you know, I want to tell stories and I want to make movies and I want to move that direction. I can't just shift tomorrow. I can't just say, you know what? No more Paris content. I'm going to go back to writing fantasy stories and expect that audience to follow me because most of them won't. Most of them aren't interested in that. And I've experimented that with that a little bit with my Kickstarters or with other projects. And this podcast is another experiment to see, you know, well, how many people do come over? And it's a it's a pretty small percentage. So what we're trying to do is give ourselves some time and some space to build a different audience, to bring over whoever's willing to come over from my existing audience. Um, whatever transformations have to happen over there over time will happen. But then uh, trying to build something where we have a little bit of momentum and there's a different income that starts to grow. So that when the time comes to shift focus away from Paris and more towards uh, the the fiction uh, that we're not just, you know, jumping off a ledge with nothing to catch us. And that's very kind of easing into it very, very slowly. I like that. Yeah, trying to. I, I don't I, if, if only I had won the lottery, then things would be so different. Fair, but I want to change gears a little bit here. You mentioned earlier when you were writing your first book, you were living on a hospital ship. It was Mercy Ships, if I'm not mistaken. Yep. And that's so it's essentially a hospital on a boat and you go around Africa and help people in need. So how do you find out about that? How does the opportunity come where you end up on this boat working there? Yeah, well, great question. And actually, that's the I've been diving into this a lot recently because the last book I kickstarted was a, a nonfiction one about how I got to Paris. And Mercy Ships is a big part of that. And um I, I mean, I heard about it because my parents were thinking about doing it. So it was back uh, after the recession and things were pretty rough. And my parents were looking at making a big change. Uh, they've been living in a small town for a long time. My dad was a pastor for 27 years and they wanted to make a change. And they heard about this Mercy Ships organization. And what Mercy Ships does is it operates the world's largest charity hospital ship. And they're about to launch a second one, the first ever built to order a uh, hospital ship. Um, and they go into mostly West African countries, but mostly outside of that, even the poorest countries in the world uh, and deliver surgical solutions. So the ship itself is like a mobile operating unit. They have five operating theaters. They go in, they do a variety of specialties depending on who they can get to volunteer. The crew is like 99% volunteer. Uh, so everybody pays their own way to come. You basically pay to work, which is confusing. And then uh, yeah, you go in, do, um, you know, eye surgeries, orthopedic surgeries, plastic surgery, which is not like lips and boob jobs. That's the, you know, people that have burn contractures, people that have serious conditions that are from injuries or from other instances, it's helping them out. Um, you have a lot of different, really fascinating things going on. Um, and I ended up working with them for about three years. Do you have any incredible stories you can share from your time on the ship? No, I have signed an NDA and I'm not allowed to say anything more than I just, oh, really? no, I'm oh, just kidding. Okay. I'm just kidding. Yeah, I can't. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm cool. just kidding. Um, sorry. Yeah, no. Um, 
Well, yeah, I mean, like one of them, I put some of the more intense stories in the book that I'm writing right now, but a lot of my like personal stories, like I grew a lot from that time and uh, I crashed more motorcycles uh, in Africa than I've crashed anywhere else. Um, the When I was in Togo, uh, we went and got, so one of the things that we would do, because you basically are living on this ship, your house goes with you, your community goes with you, and you spend either five months in a place or 10 months in a place, depending on, you know, a number of factors that are completely outside of your control. Um, and so then you spend a month or two in like a re a refitting location between them. And so we'd spent like a month in Ghana, which is right next to Togo, uh, and moved over to Togo. And as soon as we got there, what we went and bought motorcycles, it was like the first thing we did, um, which is like the most privileged Western thing you could probably do, I guess. But like we, there were so many motorcycle taxis in West Africa and in, um, Freetown, where we had been just before, there were motorcycle taxis everywhere. There was just it was just the fastest, easiest way to get around. And I had worked up enough courage and overcome enough of my terror of riding motorcycles in the swarm of fish, the school of fish that is a, a pot of motorcycles on the road that I was like, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and get one. So we all went to like this dealership, bought these 125 Sanya cheap little Chinese motorcycles, you know, that cost us like 500 bucks, something like that. Brand new. Half of it was made out of plastic. It came with like a remote start, which is just absurd. Like you've got this little keychain remote control where you can lock it, unlock it, st start it and stop it. It's like ridiculous. It did make for fun moments where you'd let somebody borrow your bike. And as soon as they rode away from you, you just turned it off. So then they had no idea why it died and they just come to a stop and can't start it again. That's fun. But aside from that, it's just absurd. Um, and so we were on these things. We're looking at them like, oh man, it was super excited. We were thinking about buying my buddy Kyle and I almost want, went in on this used BMW that was in the corner that had a sidecar. And we we're like, oh, man, we should roll around town in a sidecar. But it was way too expensive. So we we're like, no, no, no. We'll just go with the original plan. Hop on our little 125s and just pop right out onto the circular road that, got, that led back to the beach. And uh, within about 30 seconds, I was under a taxi. Um, and just he just decided to pull out right into me and uh and thankfully i like you know bounced off the car and didn't end up under the taxi myself but the motorcycle was and it took us a second to ex extract it um and then yeah with a little bit of shaken confidence hopped back on the bike and uh wandered off to find a shawarma and just let the adrenaline run its course that's crazy and was it was it during your time in, in africa when you snuck into three separate countries without the proper documentation yeah well that's uh that where did you find that one is the question because that one is that's actually like a two truths and a lie i think is where you might have found that one maybe you just called me out on my lie because i think i've only snuck into two countries illegally okay okay i'm trying to think of yeah i'm trying to think that's true well yeah so one of them was during that time one of them was uh in europe i accidentally uh got smuggled into the south korean embassy in geneva Okay. Because I just didn't get out of the car and I didn't have clearance to go in, but they didn't think about it till we were already in. And so then they're like, you have to get out, like sneak out. They literally made me sneak out back out the doors as they were closing, right? Like the, the big swinging doors are like, go, 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 go. So I had to sneak out. So that's, I, that's, I've been to South Korea, but only uh, illegally. And then, yeah, there was, there was a time where we uh, much more intentionally left the Congo and entered into a small patch of Angola called Cabinda. I don't know if you want me to tell that story or not, but that was the time. That was one of those times for sure. Yeah, you can totally tell that story. That'd be interesting. Well, basically, Cabinda is this tiny little sliver. I imagine it's the same. I haven't seen that this has changed. It's a sliver of land between the two Congos. So for anybody listening who was unaware, there are two Congos. There's the DRC, which is the really big one, the Dem Democratic Republic of Congo. That's the one you're probably thinking of. It used to be Zaire. Uh, it is massive, and it is uh, kind of like the world's largest failed state famously. It's very, uh, got a lot going on. So that's Congo, Kinshasa. And then Brazzaville across the river is the capital of the French Congo. Uh, and the French Congo has always been basically just the French Congo. It's Congo Brazzaville. Uh, it's more stable. Both of them are basically dictatorships. Uh, they, they come with their own uh, sketchy moments. And then Angola is south of them, but uh, has this little corner of land right between them. Uh, called Cabinda. And Cabinda is this jewel of territory because it is very, very oil rich. And so everybody wants it. And Cabinda not only uh, is separated physically from Angola, but it has its own separatist movement. So it has rebels that are actively trying to secede, which are, you know, it's, it is supposed or it's, uh, it's been postulated that they're supported by the Congolese governments as well. 
because of the course they want the Cabinda to secede so they can swoop in and steal it. They're, they don't want to actually help the separatists. So that's kind of the dynamic that's going on. And right before uh, we did this, there had been some sort of an incident, right? We, we heard, they told us on the ship, there's like an incident between like Cabinda and the Congo, like blah, blah, blah. We're like, oh, okay, we kind of brushed it off. We didn't really listen to it. In Cabinda, there's a fishing, right next to Cabinda, I should say, there's a fishing village that a lot of the crew, the day crew, the people that, the locals that worked with us, uh, would go to frequently and they were like you should come with us like come check it out it's a really nice little village right on the border and we're like okay so we went and uh checked it out and of course once you get there you're like well we should go look at the border i mean it's right there and you go and there's like these really tall fences and guys with ak-47s and you're like oh, okay cool and one of the day crews like hey well let's go to angola like why don't we just cross the border we do it all the time and we're like ah, ah. so my buddy josh and i uh who had had our fair share of uh you know mishaps and adventures we're like well you know we're kind of with a bunch of nurses and uh other medical personnel that most of them were fairly fresh like they they hadn't really been around for too long and so we were like well you know we feel okay about that like we were up for the adventure and we asked around the group and the the women that were with us were all like yeah let's do it like that sounds great we're like all right like we feel pretty good we're gonna keep an eye out we told them like look if we need to go back if we realize or we feel unsafe at any point let's just go back there'll be no problems um so keep your eyes open whatever so we get to the the border and the guy there is like where's your id and we're like well we don't have like our passports with us but we had our badges and our badges on the ship were effectively given the same weight uh as a passport they were just they were seen within congo at least as a valid legal id this is just part of the agreement that we had with the government and so they're like yeah that's fine just leave it with us which is like, well, I don't know if I feel good about separating myself from my ID as I cross into another country. But they're like, no, 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 it's fine. It's fine. Just leave it here. You can get it when you come back. And we're like, ah, everybody seems cool. All right. So we cross through and like the tunnel to get into no man's land is like made out of chicken wire, which is really inspires confidence. We go through, get to the other side. And I'm like, I'm feeling mostly good about this, but also very aware that it, it's kind of stupid. So at every stop along the way, every guy that has a gun, basically that I see that we cross paths with as we cross through no man's land. I'm just like, Hey man, like just smile. Like, Hey, hope you're having a great day. Hey, hope you're having a great day. You know, bonjour, ça va. Okay. Like going through the whole thing, just like, Hey, remember this pasty white face. Cause it's coming back soon. Walk all the way across, get into Cabinda. Have a great time. There's a market over there. Everything's cheaper. Everything's of like a nicer quality. Like the taxis look nicer. Like everything's great. We have a great time. I buy this ridiculous belt that's like an America belt that has like the Statue of Liberty and an eagle and a flag on it. And it is, has Nike imprinted all the way around. It's fake leather. And I'm like, this is great. So we have a good time. And like uh, suddenly kind of like as we're doing this, taking photos, whatever, I like have this itch. And I'm like, we need to go back. Like we, we got to go. So I'm like, Hey Josh, let's go like wrangle up our friends. Like, let's go, let's go, let's go ladies. So we get going back and it's a good thing we did because as we're coming back, you can see in the distance, they are changing the guard. Like all those guys who I had imprinted on like a, you know, delightful mother duck on my way out. We're now leaving. My ducklings were leaving and there were new ducklings coming that had no idea who the heck I was. And we're not going to accept me as their mother duck and might not let me back into the country. So as we go, we're like, ha ha ha, like hurrying by get by one, get by two, get by three. And then like the last guy is like, who are you? What are you doing here? What like, what do you think you're doing? You can't just cross blah, blah, blah and stops us. And it's like, yeah, this is what I didn't want to happen. So of course we're like, no, no, it's cool. It's cool. Waving frantically for whoever's at the, like the final fence to try and see us. And finally they're like, oh yeah, yeah they're, they're good. They're good. Let them through. Whew. So we get through like, oh, okay. Like we made it. We had our little hang up, got our badges back, head back to the ship. And as we're getting back in the Land Rovers, we had two Land Rovers. We reminded everybody with us, don't tell anybody that we went to Cabinda today. You can say we went to the fishing village and we had a lovely day, but don't say anything about Cabinda. Okay. Okay. Get back in the cars. Josh and I are in our own car, like with a bunch of people. And the other car somehow gets way ahead of us. So they get ahead of us. They get back to the ship and we pull up. And as we pull up, you can see on the gangway leading into the, into the ship, two men waiting who you really don't want waiting for you, the purser and the off ship security officer. And they're standing there. And as soon as they see the ship or not the ship, our Land Rover pull in, they just beeline straight for us. And it's not good. So we get out and we're like, oh boy. So we get out and the purser who is a massive man who I, who is a firefighter and uh, he was a police officer and he can, he could, he could beat up an ox. And uh, 
And then the Ashev security officer, who's also fairly large, but not intimidating in the slightest, uh, are both just furious and just they they they're yelling at us like what did the you went to Kabinda? Like, what is this? And it turns out one of the nurses had seen them. They were just coming back from dinner together, apparently. And one of the nurses coming on, they're like, Oh, where are you guys today? And she was like, Kabinda? Immediately, just immediately sold us out. And so we like are like, all right, all right, like, yeah, we know. We're sorry, we're sorry, we're sorry, whatever, blah, blah, blah. And they're like, Yeah, they're just absolutely furious. So Josh and I are like, all right, like we we should own up to this. Like, we should just go straight to the captain. It's kind of like going to your parents and fessing up, right? So we're like, we should just go tell the captain, uh, you know, what we did. So he knows we'll come clean and we'll just see what happens. So we go up, we knock on the captain's door. He's in his office. He lets us in. We tell him what we did. And he's like, all right, boys. Well, listen, we haven't really said a whole lot about this, you know, uh, because we just hoped you guys, nobody would go. But the reason that we didn't want uh, anyone going to Kabinda was because when we said there was an incident between Kabinda and the Congo, what we meant was that Kabinda separatists had carried out some sort of bombing operation effectively along the way, and then fled into the Congo. Angola saw this as the Congo's way of supporting Kabinda separatists, which is, you know, fair. So their response was that they sent their own troops into Congo and kidnapped a high-ranking general and took him back to Kabinda with them. So this is kind of a fraught situation. And to make it worse, we're, we're there under the invitation of the president of the country ourselves. So we're basically like a bunch of high-value hostages walking right into this situation willy-nilly without any idea what we're doing. And if we'd gotten stopped and held on the other side, Nothing bad probably would have happened to us, but we might have sparked an inter international incident where the Angolans used us as leverage against uh, the Congolese government, and that would not have been good. So that is the time that I not only snuck across the border illegally, but almost sparked an international incident between two hostile entities. That's a wild story. Yeah, that's not a good one. It's a good <laughs> one, but I don't recommend. I don't recommend trying it. That's crazy. But one other thing I wanted to ask you about when you were on Mercy Ships, it was actually a comment you left on one of your own YouTube videos when you were on the ships. And it said, France will always be the place I want to end up again. It's kind of a gravitational center point for me. So that was six years ago. So what is about France that's so special to you? And then how did you end up living there once again? Yeah, well, I don't know. I mean, like, I just always felt drawn here. When I was a kid, I wanted to learn French. I have the number six in my head, like ever since I was six years old. Um, I, I really couldn't tell you when it started. And I don't know why, like if it was from reading, you know, Tin Tin books or seeing Madeline or what it was. But like, I just always had a thing for Paris. And I didn't realize it was Paris. I just thought France, you know, whatever else. Went and I studied it. Um, I refused to study Spanish, which was stupid. I should have studied both. But, you know, I just was like, no, I'm going to wait until, you know, high school and then I'm going to learn. French and then managed to get over to Nice when I was just out of college. And, you know, I enjoyed it and I got to work on my French and I um, learned a lot. But I was also like, did I make a mistake? Like, this isn't where I want to be. Like, I don't I don't really don't know about this. Um, and it wasn't until I took a, a, a week long trip up to Paris at the end of my time in Nice. I was like, this is what I always wanted. Like, this is the city that I, I wanted to be in. This is the place. This is the architecture. These are the People, I didn't know. I don't know what it was. It's just this, this draw in the sense of, you know, feeling like you're coming home, and um, that that never left. And so then I made an effort to get back. I got to Paris halfway through my time with Mercy Ships. I was still working with Mercy Ships, but I worked for them from Paris for a year, and then uh, I couldn't stay. The visa situation is very challenging, and I couldn't figure out how to stay. I didn't have any money because I was volunteering in West Africa. So where where would I make money? Um, but I really, really always wanted to come back. And, and I'm very fortunate that um, I was able to apply for a talent visa and get one. Because um, there are a lot of people that are much more talented than I am that have been recently denied for the same visa. Um, I think I just managed to get in because I was one of the first people to get this visa. But um, yeah, I've just always felt a real draw to come back here. And the story of you getting that visa, one of the first people to get it is interesting because you initially applied for a visa that didn't exist, right? Well, that's the thing. I, yeah, I applied. It, I thought it existed when I applied for it. Um, the I, I basically walked in, and um, 
I there's this visa that used to exist called Compétences et Talents. So it's a skills and talents visa. And it was like the holy grail of visas when I lived here last time because it would last for three years and you were legal to work and do your own thing. And so that's that's what I wanted, but I couldn't qualify for it back then. And so I kind of was at the end of my rope. Like I had a couple of book deals like we were talking about earlier that fell through. I had been investing a lot of my time and money and energy and everything into a tech startup that would uh, fail as well. And I just didn't have, I didn't know what to do. I was really lost. I was on the verge of going bankrupt and just under a ton of pressure and with nothing to show for it. And so I came here for a visit. Um, and this is after I started vlogging. I actually came here for a visit in the midst of trying to launch this tech startup and failing. And I had a friend who was like, well, if you can get back here, like, I'll get you a job teaching English. Like, that's no problem. And I was like, well, can you get me the visa? Because I, I can't work here. And she's like, no, no, you get here legally, but then I'll hook you up. It's like, well, that's the main problem. Like, if I can be here legally. So I, you know, was like, all right, well, I'll go home. I'll figure this out. And so I, I decided to apply for that visa, which when I went to apply for it in San Francisco, um, I looked and I was like, well, there's no, it doesn't say you know, it's not in their list. So I Googled it, Competence et Talent, San Francisco, and I found it. And I was like, oh, here it is. Like, there's a page for it. It's just not in their menu. So I found it and I got the documents together and I set an appointment. And I was really fortunate because I was really at my my rope's end and, and I couldn't, all I had, there's a whole long story that goes into this, obviously. But like, my dad was really for, I love my dad so much. And he saw just how destitute, like I was so depressed and I was in such a bad place and really was kind of on my last leg. And he was just like, hey, like, I, I'll, I will use some of my air miles to send you to San Francisco, like, go do this appointment, like, because I couldn't, I really couldn't afford to do it. And so I was like, all right, so I went, applied for it. And when I walked in, it was very much like walking up to a bank teller, right? Like, they're like, all right, why are you here? And I said, for this visa, it's like, okay, so he gets his book, and he opens it, it's a three ring binder, and he flips through it. And he's just like, huh, and he flips back through it. And he's like, huh, I don't, I don't like, what was it called again? And I tell him, he's like, yeah, I, I don't see that in here. It's like, well, it's on your website. And he's like, oh, okay. So he goes to look. And I'm like, no, no, it's not in the menu. It's not in the menu. This should have been a flag. I was like, no, no, it's not in the menu. Um, but if you Google for it like this, specifically like this, you'll find the page. So he did. And he found the page and he pulled it up. And he's like, well, all right, but there it is. So he copied it, pasted it into a Word document, printed that Word document, and then processed my visa off of that Word document that he just printed uh, and took my money and took my fingerprints and whatever else and was like, all right, like, see ya, you know, see ya never. And so sent me off. And so I waited a couple weeks, you know, and I'm just in a really bad, I'm just in a bad spot. And it's like my last little glimmer of hope because I really didn't know what I was going to do. Um, and after a couple of weeks, I was like, man, like, cause they keep your passport too. So it's not like I was, I, I, I was able to just bounce out of the country and become a, a bum anywhere else. And so finally I emailed them and I was like, Hey, what's up? And they're like, Oh yeah, we already emailed you. Like here's, here it is like basically, um, which is not a good feeling when you email the, the consulate to be like, where's my email? And they're like, Oh, we already emailed you. We're waiting for your response. That's ugh, not a good feeling. So then I, uh, they fill out like, basically they're like, well, look, the, the visa that you applied for doesn't exist anymore. Which is also not a good feeling. Um, but they said, there's another visa being developed in Los Angeles right now, and we think you might qualify for it. They didn't tell me what the visa, I don't think they even knew what the visa was. I have no idea. Like, there's no information. If you, for anybody listening who wants to move to France or live in France, be prepared to never know anything because they won't tell you anything. There's no information. There's, it's, it's great. It's my favorite. So anyways, they, they're like, well, we think you'd qualify. They just want a little more documentation. Would you like us to pass your dossier along? And I was just like, Yes. And this is the single nicest moment that I've ever heard of in French bureaucratic history, because normally they would not have said any of this because, again, no information. They just would have sent my passport back without any explanation and been like denied. And that would have been it. Um, so they pass it along to Los Angeles. Uh, a little bit later, they asked me for some more documents. I send those in and then I get this email where they're just like, all right, when would you like to arrive in France? Which does it? That's not phrased like you got it. Congratulations. When it was just like, when would you like to arrive in France? Like hypothetically, last test question. When do you want to show up? And it, that's also stressful. Like that induces all of this every step along the way induces an, an insane amount of stress. And so you're just like, um. And I'm looking at like I for I had this job uh, that had I'd been able to rack up a bunch of air miles with before gambling everything on my own projects. And so my status with that airline ran out on March 1st at the end of February that year. 
And it was February 17th when I got this email and I needed that status to be able to move without you know, like free luggage, basically free for oversized bags, whatever, like they would have shipped them. So I was like, how about February 28th? And, uh, and then they didn't, I don't think they even responded. I think I was just like left with like, okay, like, I don't know what that means, but I guess I gotta better go buy like a giant tub to put my stuff in. And then I booked a flight on the faith that it would show up and my passport did show up and it had a visa in it. And I had no idea. That was the first time I ever saw the visa or knew that it was a passport talent. I had no idea what the name of the visa was. No idea how long it was good for. No idea if I was legal to work, nothing. I was just like, well, I have this visa. I have nothing here. I have an airline ticket that I don't have to pay for beyond like the taxes, whatever. I'm out of here. And so I just packed my stuff up, jumped on the plane and flew to Paris and had no idea if I was even legal to work or stay or anything, but here I am. That's wild, which kind of this, that, that hearing that story of how much you had to kind of go through just to get the visa leads it perfectly to my next question, because I heard you say one time you have to fight to live in Paris. Why, what can you explain a bit more? Like once you actually get there, how you have to fight to stay there? Well, I mean, they, they send uh, a troop of bandits over uh, once every third week after the half moon. And you have to be able to track that before they show up with their clubs to beat you. Uh, and if you, yeah, no, I'm just kidding again, but the, like, it's a nightmare. It, it, life is like that. Actually, that, that analogy is not too far off because like, for example, I have a friend that just got here and he has, he has a, whether you have a tourist visa or the visa that I have, he has a year long tourist visa. They don't tell you anything. You just show up. They don't give you like a to-do list. They don't give you like, Hey, assemble these documents. They don't tell you anything. What you don't know. And you find out one way or another is you've got three months to get into the prefecture and get the paperwork started to get to a medical office and get an in-country medical exam done. There's a whole bunch of stuff like that, but like there's no website that chronicles all of it. The every, everywhere you go has pseudo information and they protect a lot of that information because they just want to be able to basically to screw with you, but also because like, they, I mean, in a way, but also because that way they can push back for whatever reason, they can find a way of getting rid of you if they want to, which is kind of a cynical, but I think not dishonest way of looking at it. And so, um, you like just to figure out my own situation, I didn't know, like I said, if my visa was good for anything or like what it was. So I had to go to like my local mayor's office and ask them, they were like, oh, well, you have to go to this place. So they sent me to another place, which then was like, go to this website and sign up for this thing. And then when you go to the website, that thing's not there. And so then you call the number on the website and they don't answer. And so eventually four calls later in a week, who knows how much time goes by, somebody answers and it's like, oh no, it's on the website. And you say, I looked, I didn't see it. And they say, oh, well, that little map of Paris or France, there's like a little icon that was a map of France. Yeah, click on that. And then the phone numbers are on the other side of that for the whatever. And you're like, what? Like, what is this? And so you're just going around in those kinds of circles where nobody really tells you anything. And then when you finally get in to do the paperwork, and they're like, okay, well, here's the list. Bring these things. Then when you come back, they're like, oh, well, that thing's not good enough because these reasons we didn't tell you. And also you're missing this other thing that we didn't tell you needed to bring. And you're lucky if they tell you both of those things at the same time, because odds are good. They just tell you that one's not good. Come back again. And then when you come back, they're like, where's the other thing? And you're like, what thing? And they're like, that thing you should have known to bring that we didn't tell you to bring. And how, what? And so like, that's, that's what you go through for months, possibly unless you're lucky enough to work for like a company that sponsored you that like organizes it all for you. Um, but even if they do, you still have to go sit and like, they're really, what they're doing is, and I don't, I, it's miserable, but it's a rite of passage we all go through. They're really just checking to see, do you really want to be here? Like, and how badly do you want to be here? Cause there are a lot of people that run into this and just like, screw it. I'm going home. You know, they're not going to stay. And I had to go through this for a year for my visa, which was miserable. Um, and partially because I, they didn't know what it was. So they put me in the wrong office and I was going and seeing the wrong people for most of a year um, who literally sat me down and were like, we don't think you deserve to be here. Like, why did you get this visa? And it's like, I don't know. Why was I born? I can't tell you these things. Like, these are mysteries that man cannot know. I don't know why I got the visa. Just, just let me stay. Um, so it's pretty demoralizing and it hurts your feelings from time to time, but it does teach you a lot about standing up for yourself and like believing in yourself and believing in your own worth and projecting confidence. You don't really have in moments where you have to. And as long as you're deferential and kind and respectful, but firm, um, you you'll go a lot farther than if you demand your way or definitely don't ask to see the manager. Cause they're liable to just be like, okay, stamp a denial, uh, stamp across your thing. And then be like, I'll be right back with my manager. Um, so you got to be careful with that, but, uh, yeah, France is like, 
France, France makes you fight to be here in so many ways that you never see coming um, and that are really difficult. Uh, but that, I don't know, you know, if as, assuming you can get a break from it from time to time, which I really need sometimes, like it's, a, it's also a fantastic place to live. And I'm so happy that I can be here. That's awesome. So and I want to kind of jumping off of that point, get into your YouTube, which kind of helps people that are coming to France, whether to move or to visit you're so you've been on YouTube for about seven years now, right? Yeah. Oh, so YouTube. Yeah. I mean, I've been on YouTube. Yeah. For a long time. I just have been more serious about it probably in the last four years. I was going to say it was about 2016 where Casey and I started his daily vlog and that really changed your relationship with the platform, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. All, all props to Casey. And it's like, what are some things you learned from Casey when he started his daily vlog? Well, I think, I mean, the, I think it's the same thing. I I'm, I'm a, I'm as cliche as the next uh, YouTuber on this one. I think that like, or the next vlogger, at least, uh, like I'd done like vlog brother style vlogging where you sat in front of a camera and jump cut around to keep it interesting. And I'd, I'd done some walking and talking, like I'd done your basic vlogging stuff. And then I'd also made skits and I'd, um, you know, made a whole bunch of videos while I was on the ship, like public service announcements and stuff. And I, I made videos all the way back to when I was a kid, but I never thought about combining the two. And what blew my mind, uh, which I think blew the collective mind of the internet at the time was just when Casey did both at the same time and combined them. Um, and that was absolutely illuminating. Um, and then I was like, I have to do this. Like, this is, this is so cool. I want to do this. And then I tried and I made some videos, uh, and it was hard. It was so, I, I, you know, I didn't last. I tried, I tried and I was like, this is brutal. Like, this is so much work. Um, and, uh, you know, then I came back to it later and was able to do it thankfully, but like so much respect for him for, for doing that. And just in so many ways. Um, I think now he's got some uh, baggage that he's dealing with from the experience, which I totally understand because I, I think he really burned out. And I know that I struggled with that as well. But like, I still, I learned so much just about the, the just opening that door, but also in watching Casey, he was somebody that he would do things and talk about things and uh, be vulnerable in ways that gave me permission to do it as well. And there were a lot of things that I was struggling with or that I wasn't sure if I should talk about or share or show in my own life. That in seeing him do it removed those fears in a way. And that was a gift that he continually gave that I always felt better. Even if I didn't want to watch a Casey video for one reason or another, as soon as I watched Casey Neistat, for whatever reason, I always walked away feeling better about the world. And then within my own work, I felt freer to do what it was that I wanted to do or that I was scared to do. And I think that more than anything technical or Anything else? I think those are the those are some pretty deep things that he he gave me that uh, that I will probably I hope will always stay with me. And ultimately, you started your own daily vlog, and you went for three years, right? Yeah, I went. Yeah, three three years and some months. Yeah, that's so. What was like your? That's I just can't even imagine doing a daily vlog for over three years. What was your goal when you started doing it, or did you have one? It was. I can't imagine it anymore either. I I think about it like I think about returning to it sometimes, or I'm like. Oh yeah, I'd love to like I miss it. And I'm like, yeah, I could totally do this. And then I'm um, whoa, no. Like what? <laughs> like how? 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 I don't even know. Like my whole life revolved around it. Um I I really I mean, I had I had some I definitely had some ulterior pipe dream hopes in there as far as like wanting to hit it big or, you know, be able to do it for a living and so forth. And and thankfully actually the I never hit it big, but the being able to do it for a living was something that actually did, um, you know, manifest over time or become be, not manifest. I don't want to use that word, but like, you know, became a reality over time. Um, but I really, for me, I had a lot of personal goals that were more important to me. And those were like, on the professional side, I wanted to be disciplined. I wanted to show up every day. I wanted to tell a story every day. And I wanted to use it as a way of honing my ability to tell stories, which I really needed. Like if you go back and watch my early ones, there's you can definitely see a limit to what I could accomplish. Um, and so I wanted to show up and do that. But personally, like there was stuff like just wanting to be comfortable talking on camera and being able to talk on camera anywhere, anytime and not feel self-conscious about it or at least overcome those fears in the moment. Um, you know, there was a lot of there were a lot of goals around it that way where I knew that I couldn't control if anybody hit the subscribe button, if anybody showed up, if anybody cared. But I could control my contribution to it and I could grow and improve and learn from the whole experience. 
And so I really geared myself much more towards that. Like I was still working multiple jobs and I was still struggling in so many ways. But for me, it also was, there was a, a hope that was also realized that I would connect with people outside of my little world where I felt fairly unappreciated and unseen for who I was. But by reaching out via YouTube, I was hoping that I could, and I did manage to find people that appreciated me for who I was and what I was trying to do um, and stuck with me through all that. So that, that, that was probably finding the people that I found and like my patrons and a number of the longtime fans that I've uh, found and some friends that I've made is definitely the, I mean, they, it's cheesy to say that the best that, you know, the vlog was the friends we made along the way, but you know, it, it's true. I actually wanted to talk about your Patreon if you were cool with that for a second. So you're sitting at about 42,000 YouTube subscribers but and you have 456 patrons, which I, based on the stats on your Patreon, contribute enough for you to have live pretty much off of just your Patreon. So yeah, I feel like a lot of people think like you need to have millions of followers or subscribers in order to be a full-time creator, but you found a way to do it with less than 50,000 subscribers, which I think is a really interesting insight for people listening to that, that you don't need to be massive. So when did you decide to get on, get onto Patreon? And at what point were you able to basically make it your main source of income? Well, I think I was actually, I was able to go full-time on YouTube like uh, a year and a half ago or maybe two years ago. So I only, I maybe only had like 20,000 or less subscribers at the time. Um, and really what it came down to, I mean, so the thing is, it's part of the story. I wish, I wish I could just like transmit the, cause I just finished the second draft of this book and I just wish I could beam it into your head um, for some of the imagery, but like basically my first season of vlogging was a massive failure in the sense that I, I vlogged every day for 54 weeks. I decided, don't ask, it was, I made, I made the season 54 weeks long just because I had intros, intro characters for every day. Um, and I had to pre-record those and I pre-recorded them with the numbers like vlog a day 19. Um, and then they would, it was the same guy for Monday, every Monday. So I had seven different characters. I had to record all that. And, uh, and so like I was committed to it and then I recorded an additional two weeks at the end, just in case. And then I was like, well, I can't not use these. They're the best part. Like they get upset that they're still around and then they quit on the last day. So like I have to use these. So then I made it's stupid. I'm just going to start yelling at myself because what a, what an idiot. So I, I vlogged every day for 54 weeks um, and I still didn't have even a thousand subscribers at that point. And uh, there was a period in there for like two months where I didn't earn a single subscriber. Um, and I was just like, what am I doing? Like, I'm obviously an idiot because like nobody wants to see this. Um, and so I was just like, okay, well, like I took a moment and that was the one time I did take a break. I took a break that summer from vlogging daily, which I wouldn't do again until I was finished um, and was working multiple jobs, uh, hoofing it and, you know, drank a lot and was just like, what am I doing with my life? Um, and what was interesting about it was that that number, that subscriber number just continued to slowly tick upwards. And I crossed the thousand subscriber mark while I wasn't actively making videos. And for anybody who's done YouTube that, you know, the thousand subscriber mark is just a huge landmark. And, um, and I was like, okay, there's something here. I have to do this, but that, that means I have to reevaluate like what I've been doing. And the biggest failure that I saw in what I was doing was that like with my, the failures that we've mentioned earlier, the two books that fell through, well, it was a book, one book when I was vlogging, it was one book, a Kickstarter for a book, and then the Kickstarter for my tech company. Um, I hadn't really shared just how much it meant to me. Like I hadn't shared the hopes and the dreams that I had tied up with these Kickstarters and, and book deals, whatever else. Like I hadn't really gone into like why it was important to me. Um, and I hadn't talked about what it meant to me. And so when they failed to come through, I also didn't really talk about how much it hurt and how far I'd fallen and how how dire things were really getting. And in doing so, I, I had robbed my audience of a real understanding of the story of my life, of the situation I was in, of everything that they were supposedly going to be uh, invested in. And so in approaching a second season, I was like, I have to treat myself like a character in a long form story. I have to think of this in terms of like, what does the audience need to know? What do I need to share? And that was really scary because it meant being really vulnerable about things that I was likely to fail at and things that, you know, might not come to fruition. And I was terrified of that. And I was like, you know, what? no, I need to do that. And the other part of that was I also need to 
if I value, if other people value my work, I need to value it the same. And I need to open the doors to their generosity, much the way I had done when I was living and volunteering with Mercy Ships and people had supported, supported me doing that. So I made a commitment to redo my Patreon, which at the time was geared much more towards my writing than my YouTubing. And I was like, I'm going to retool this to the small audience that I have uh, in a way that I think they'll engage with. And then I'm going to commit to pumping it a couple times a month. And I'm going to actually go out and say, please support me on Patreon um, and make a case for it. And so I did. And at the time I was making 150 bucks a month on Patreon. Um, I had, you know, maybe a dozen patrons and I've been encouraged by this one patron who started giving me 50 bucks a month um, because he just loved my YouTube channel so much. And so I was like, all right, I'm going to stick with this. And so I stuck to that plan. I tried to be as vulnerable as I could be safely on the internet. I tried to share my story. I tried to share my hopes and my dreams, my goals, and then be honest about them when I failed and also share in the moments when I succeeded. And slowly but surely things, you know, just kind of continued growing. And I've never had like a viral moment. I've never grown rapidly or massively. I've never had a jump in anything. Like even my biggest videos, even as they're getting close to like a half million views, um, you know, that's just because they're viewed a thousand times a day and they're relevant to tourism and whatever else. It's not because it's shareable or anything like that. And but what was cool about it was as I continued to share that the core elements of my life and my story and uh, and try to be more present and more vulnerable um, and ask people to be a part of it, they did. And so there was a slow but steady growth that really, you know, it never, again, jumped in a huge way, it never was massive, but over the course of like a year grew by about 20% per month, which obviously compounds nicely to get to a place where all of a sudden you're making a decent income. Um, and so, I mean, that was a lot of it was I really focused in on okay, well, who is my audience? How do they engage with me? How can I add value to that without adding a backbreaking amount of work to my own plate? Like, how do I give them something more that they'll really appreciate without making life harder for myself? Um, and, you know, tweaked it, adjusted it, and then uh, made sure to engage very heavily with it and, uh, you know, and show them my appreciation in every way I could along the way. My big takeaway from that in terms of you kind of explaining that whole thing is just focus on creating authentic and genuine relationships with your followers and subscribers, because ultimately that's more important than just focusing on how many people can you get it all at once. It's focusing on one-to-one -one actual relationships. But I want to jump back a little bit there. When you were talking about when you first were doing the daily blog, those 54 weeks when you had less than a thousand subscribers, how did you find it in you to keep going during that entire time when you knew that the subscriber number wasn't going up and wasn't where you wanted it to be? Well, because I love doing it. I mean, like I, I didn't, I mean, I can't say that I didn't care because obviously you care and because the whole ecosystem is built around subscriber count. So you, if you don't have a hundred thousand subscribers, you can't use the YouTube space, you know, like all these kinds of things, like where it's like, it's just baked in, like you're, you're small creators are not actively, but naturally are kind of invalidated in a way. And I definitely felt that pressure. Um, especially when meeting other people in, and I still feel that to a degree, like I thankfully made some good friends in the, in that arena, but to understand my success from it, you know, is to have a pretty nuanced view of things, I think. And so the, the number one metric that does matter to most people is that subscriber count. And so for me, like I, that was always present, but I, I also, I didn't care in the sense that like, I don't know, like I loved making the videos. I really enjoyed the challenge and finding a different way to make doing my laundry interesting, you know, for someone else and finding cool things to share and going, you know, I don't know, like the, the, the act of actually creating was what kept me going. I really just like making the videos. And so that's why for me, like I did need a little bit of that encouragement after, because it was a sh shaboodle worth of work. It was a lot of work. If you want to. I, I wasn't sure if this is a swear friendly <laughs> podcast, but like I, you know, it was so much work. It's an ungodly amount of work. Um, most people don't appreciate it whatsoever. It's one of the reasons I started editing live on YouTube. Something was just so people could see what that three to four hours was like, um, every day. And, uh, and so when I got to the end of it, I stuck with my commitment and I loved it and I was happy with it, but I was also working multiple jobs and struggling just to make ends meet. Um, and so I had to evaluate and I was like, why am I doing this? You know, what, what am I hoping to get out of it? Do I want to keep doing it? And I was leaning towards yes, but I was also like, but if, you know, if nobody, 
I can't, I can't just keep doing this for my own. There's got to be another outlet that leads somewhere, you know? And so that's why it was, it didn't take much, but just those, whatever those maybe 30 subscribers were that showed up over the course of a week, you know, just slowly dripping in. That was enough for me to be like, you know what? Like that is the first time I've seen like organic growth to my channel. I really believe that it meant there was something that I had something, um, which might've been delusional. I don't know, but, uh, I was like, no, I was so excited to get back to it that I could hardly wait. And then I spent a few weeks planning and plotting and getting ready. Um, and that's something that actually I miss now where I need to take more time to plan and before executing. But once you get on that ride, it's hard, hard to, hard to stop. But ultimately you end up, you did end up stopping. You stopped doing the daily vlog. When and why did you decide to do that? Was it a hard decision for you to come to? I, I finished out my third 54 week season because I'm an idiot. Um, so like I, yeah, no, I, I wanted to finish it. I wanted to, I thought about quitting at a thousand and I was like, no, I'm gonna, I'm stubborn is what it comes down to. I was like, no, I'm going to, I'm going to do this. I wanted to be proud of myself and I wanted to do something I was proud of. And I mean, the trade-off was the videos. I felt like the videos I was making by the end weren't good or weren't good enough. Um, but I knew I needed to, I knew I needed to stop for a long time before I stopped. Um, and it was, it was hard and it was scary because I was worried that my income would dry up and I would wreck. It was so hard to build what little I had built. Um, I was so scared to lose it. Um, but I needed to, cause otherwise I was just going to die. I was so burned out and so furious at the stupidest little things and exhausted and not sleeping and miserable and not just not enjoying anything. And, um, so I kind of just set up, okay, I'm going to stop you know, on this day. And of course I stopped a day after that because why not push it through one more day? Uh, and, uh, and that was, that was, that was it. And then the question has been, and still is like, well, how do I come back to it? Like I'm still, I'm making like weekly vlogs now and, and, you know, French Fridays videos about Paris and, and traveling and whatever else, but I, we're still, we're, I think we're coming out of this transition period and we've been working on other projects, like you mentioned the podcast and some other stuff, trying to get things up and running, trying to redirect that energy somewhere else. And I'm getting more excited about making YouTube videos again, which is really good. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of unanswered questions for me. And so stopping was one thing, but at the same time, I never really stopped. I was still making like a weekly vlog during my break for the woman I was dating at the time, um, just as a gift to her. And that was a mistake because I should have really fully stopped. Um, but I don't know. I don't know. Now I feel like I'm rambling. I don't know if I'm answering your question because I'm lost. I, I, you, you can tell me what I'm supposed to do with my life, Jacob. That's fine. This is, uh, I don't know. If we can I, turn it to Jacob's corner. <laughs> I don't know if I have the answers, but I was going to ask, I feel like because I've talked to multiple daily vloggers through this podcast and I feel like a lot of them come to that point where they are, they're burnt out from doing the daily vlog. So I'm curious in your mind, like in your opinion, was it worth it? And would you recommend someone do a daily vlog? Uh, well, I mean, those go hand in hand, don't they? Uh, in a lot of ways, yeah, it was totally worth it because for me as a person, like I'm never going to be satisfied unless I'm working on my own thing. Uh, and it, it was also a passion thing. I don't think that's a thing. I, it was an ends to a means for me because I got lucky or a means to, excuse me, it was a means to an end for me more because I got lucky. I feel like in a lot of ways than anything. And because I was doggedly persistent in the face of severe uh, potential health crises. Um, I don't, I don't know that I'd recommend it to anybody necessarily because I think, I don't think YouTube rewards it as much anymore. I think you'd want to look and see what, what, what is it that's actually moving on YouTube? And then I would lean towards something you want to do and you're excited about. I think the number one thing you should be doing if you're going to get into any of this is, is whatever gets you the most excited and whatever it is that you're going to show up and rock, uh, every day or every week or whenever it is. If you subscribe yourself to any given format, medium, content type, whatever it is, just because you're hoping that it gets you somewhere, not because you love doing it, it's going to kill you. Even if you make it somewhere, it's absolutely going to kill you. Um, so I would say the, the first question is really, what do you want to do? And then if daily, if daily uh, gets you there, like if you want to tell the story of your life and you see that as something valuable and exciting and what do you want to do, then yeah jump into it, give it a go. But do be aware, you set some serious limits for yourself uh, that, uh, you know, push yourself. It's like boot camp. I mean, it's like jumping into the Navy SEALs <laughs> to make myself sound cool. Um, you know, it's like, you're going to push yourself beyond any limits you ever thought you had. I didn't realize that I could function with so little sleep for so long. Um, but then the costs are very real as well. Um, and the depression and the 
the struggles and the, whether the ex, they're existential or physical or anything like it, it definitely causes its damage. And there's a reason that all these daily vloggers that we you know, loved and worshiped have all burned out and sworn it off. And some of them have never even come back to the internet, you know, as far as we can see. So um, I would also be very cautious. One thing you mentioned there when you're talking about is vlogging might not be what is best for YouTube right now. One thing I wanted to ask you about is a lot of your videos tend to be longer in terms of duration, 15, 16, 20 minutes. Is that because you're trying to get a longer average view duration, which YouTube prefers, or is that just how your editing workflow works? And that's usually what you end up with. Uh, it's kind of a sense of guilt that drives it. Cause I used to give people a video every day and now they only get one a week. Um, well, because actually there was a really positive response to it too. Like a lot of my core audience and my core audience is what I'm always most concerned with, um, which is why also I'm not growing rapidly on YouTube. And it's also, it's a concern. I got to figure out some other stuff right now. Um, but no, it's just kind of, it actually just kind of flowed from the natural conversation with my viewership uh, as much as anything. And, um, and I did see a lot of, like, like you're saying, a lot of YouTubers leaning that way towards getting the average view duration up and long form content does seem to be something that uh, is rewarded right now. So that was definitely a part of the process. Um, but uh, it was not an SEO decision. It was really just like, I can tell a long story now. I can make a video that holds my core audience till the end. Um, it's a skill I've developed that I'm going to put to use. And so I just kind of do it. But now I'm definitely playing with the idea of doing a lot of shorter videos. Like I just went to the Louvre today just to see if it was closed because everybody keeps asking me. And it's like, I'm just going to throw up a quick three minute video of me at the Louvre because why not? Um, and not be so, because now, now I'm feeling beholden to a 20 minute long video format. And it's like, no, that's not good either. Like I need to, I want to mix it up. I don't know. I just want to do whatever comes to me and see what happens. That's fair. And you said you're, so you're focused on your core audience right now. And so is growing your channel not a high priority for you? I mean, you've got it to a point now where it is a significant portion of your income. You have a loyal fan base is growing at something you want to do? Or are you happy with its current state? I'm really, well, that's hard. I'm really happy with it. Um, I'm not, I'm not concerned with growing it, but that's also a problem because I know that that's limiting a lot of what I could be doing. And, um, and I should, I should be trying to grow it because I think that there's an even bigger audience out there to find. Um, so this is another, I've, I've been having some conversations with some people about this specifically because I'm also not I'm not an, I'm obviously not an expert on growing the channel. Otherwise it would have grown by now. I think I'm really good at the core audience thing, um, which is really valuable to me. So uh, to answer your question, yeah, I'd like to figure out how to grow it. And I'm going to, I think I've got, I've got some concerns to deal with first. Um, but I, yeah, I, I think I'd need to think about growing it in the future. Fair enough. And I wanted to ask quickly, I have a couple standard questions I ask at the end of every episode before that. I want to ask about one other thing. And that was your, so you did a daily vlog, but you also do a daily photo on Instagram. You're over 3,300 days in a row now. Where did that start? Yeah, that was because I was moving to uh, South Africa and I had no idea if anybody would know what was going on with me. <laughs> so I was like, hey, I'll just do this. Um, and I'm a terrible journaler. And um I ended up being very good at blogging every week while I was away. So I, I did share a lot more than I was afraid I would, but I don't know. I just thought it'd be a really fun way to journal my life. And I'm a glutton for pain and I like to demonstrate my discipline publicly, apparently. So I'm also just an arrogant braggart. And that's apparently where it came from. Most of the photos were terrible for a long time, but now occasionally I get a decent one in there. So it's fun. And so is your following on Instagram because you're sitting at over 12,000. Is that all people that have been redirected from YouTube or is that people that have started following along because of your photo a day challenge? It's a really good question. I think it's a, a mix because, oh yeah, not the photo a day challenge. Nobody cares about that. Um, like people, people, people come to appreciate it, but nobody, nobody cares about my photo a day, which is part of the reason vlogging daily was way more fun was because you could actually get a story out of it. Um, yeah, no, I think a lot of it's redirect from YouTube, but it's hard to know for sure because the demographics are also a bit different. Um, so, and I don't know if that's platform demographics or if that's, I don't, I, I honestly couldn't tell you, but I would, I would guess that 70, 70 to 80% have to be from YouTube uh, for sure. Fair enough. But I want to ask, what is like your long-term goal with everything? Like, what does that look like for Jay Swanson? Well, it's getting, I think it's what we were talking about earlier with the, the stories. I mean, I want to get back into fiction and I want to, I want to share those stories with the world. And there's a couple other projects. Like I'd like to get a little bit into documentary making about some causes that really have stuck with me. And I'd like to figure out how to tell stories in different places to keep things fresh. I obviously like doing a lot of different things because I like to 
I like I, I like the 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 full the jack of all trades, the full rhyme, right? A jack of all trades, but a master of none is often better than a master of one, right? Um, and which is just my way of patting myself on the back and trying not to feel like I'm just failing at everything in life at the same time. But I like to keep it varied. But down the line, yeah, I want to, I want to, I want to bring this fictional universe that I've been playing in for the last decade. I want to bring it properly to the fore and find an audience for it and um, get to tell that story to the fullest uh, before I, you know, croak and get shuffled off this mortal coil. Well, that's awesome. I'm looking forward to seeing that all come to fruition. <laughs> so am I. I hope, <laughs> hope it works out. Uh, but before we wrap up, so I have these standard five or six questions I ask everybody. I used to call it rapid fire, but these aren't really rapid fire type questions. So I don't really have a name for it. But the first one being you're going to dinner. You could take three people. It could be anybody dead or alive. Who do you take to dinner? I uh, would t- dead or alive. Can they be fictional or not? Sure, let's go fix though. <laughs> I don't know. Well, because I just started rewatching Avatar The Last Airbender and I want to take uh, uh, Zuko's uncle to dinner. I just think he'd be a great dinner guest. He's so jo- jovial and pleasant. Um, Abraham Lincoln, I would be fascinated to take to dinner. I think that's fairly standard, but I've just been thinking about him a lot today. And then Macklemore, because his writing uh, and music has been so inspirational to me as an independent artist. That's awesome. What are some of the best advice you've ever been given? The best advice I've ever been given, uh, duck. <laughs> Can you explain that one a little bit more? <laughs> well, I mean, I, I didn't get hit in the head with the pan, so it worked out really well. Fair enough. When, you're, when your alarm goes off in the morning, what motivates you to get up and out of bed? Uh, coffee. What is one thing about you people wouldn't expect? I love coffee. No, I guess people would expect that. Uh, what is one thing about me that people wouldn't expect? Uh, people often don't expect me to be very athletic. I think they look at me and think I'm kind of like, uh, I'm less chunky than I used to be, but I, people are often surprised that I can move or that I can dance. Um, so I'm limber. I don't have arthritis. I don't know why people think I do. What's one thing that's so important. Everyone needs to know, uh, how to do your taxes and all of us are failing. That's I feel like I should be giving you more serious answers right now, but I'm just giving you whatever is coming to mind. No, that's good. That's good. I like the different direction. Everyone tries to get super serious with these, but sometimes it's refreshing to not always All right. that way. That's cool. Well, there you go. Then I'll, we'll keep at it. So for the last question, I like to flip the script a little bit. So it's not me asking the question. It's you asking the question, but it's not to me. So pretend you have a crystal ball and you can ask this crystal ball any question and you will get the answer. What is one question you'd want to know the answer to? Where is the woman of my dreams? And like... Can I have her number? <laughs> <laughs> awesome. I love it. But I want to thank you so much for taking the time to be on this podcast. I want to give you the floor. Where can the people find you, plug everything and anything you got right now? Absolutely. Well, I, just my name, Jay Swanson, J-A-Y-S-W-A-N-S-O-N. You can find me on YouTube or Instagram and everywhere else from there. And then the podcast that we're working on that Jacob so graciously plugged earlier is called Building the Oracle. Again, if you search for my name on Spotify or wherever you should find it, but Building the Oracle will also bring it up. And it's the podcast of us trying to struggle our way through starting a publishing house and film studio. Awesome. I want to thank you once again for coming on the podcast. And I want to thank everybody for listening. Whether you've listened the entire way through, you've only listened to bits and pieces. I really appreciate you taking time to check this out. Everyone do me a big favor. Go and subscribe to Jay on YouTube. Go and follow his podcast. Follow him on Instagram. I'll make sure everything's linked in the show notes down below. And if you'd like to follow me, you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at, at the Jacob Kelly. Feel free to come and say hello. My DMs are always open. And if you'd like to follow the podcast, you can find us on Instagram at, at my social life podcast or on YouTube by searching up my social life. Thank you once again for listening, everybody. We'll talk soon.